super happy to see you guys. Abdul, what's up, Abdul? That's one of my uh, Coffee Posse members. Um, awesome, I wish I could say hi to all of you personally. Um, okay, so here we are, you guys. Uh, I'm super excited uh, to give you a little kind of timeline-y logistics kind of situation with what we got going on here. Um, we're expecting to go for about an hour, but um, this is live and unscripted and, you know, we might go a little bit over. So that's why I said in my email to allow a little bit of extra time, um, 90 minutes. Um, we will, after our sort of basic training, we will be opening up the floor uh, to questions and questions you can pop into the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen, uh, or you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. So uh, anybody who has questions and actually wants to be on audio, we would love to hear from you. It's, I think, always so great, at least for me, when, when, uh, when I'm reminded of like what a global community we are and being able to hear your voices is always like really kind of fun. Um, Jay has a great love. voice too, but I love to hear everybody else's. Um, it's all in the microphone. It's all in the microphone. I don't, yeah, <laughs> my super ghetto microphone. Like you can tell, like I'm not the one with the podcast, which we'll talk about actually in a second. Um, so you guys see Jay sitting here. Uh, obviously a lot of you are used to my face because you're probably here because of my YouTube channel. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. Um, hello to everyone else who just joined. Our, our number popped up a little bit there in the last couple of minutes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited. Um, I get to introduce sort of my co-host for the evening. You uh, might recognize uh, his name from a video that I actually did. I guess it was a few months ago where I gave a shout out to the top um, content creators that you should follow in 2020 for Mad Inspiration. And Jay was one of the content creators um, that I came across and had never met him before. We had never talked before. I just gave him a shout out in my video. And of course, because he's such a gracious and amazing guy, he reached out and said, thank you so much. I'm like, yeah, thank you. You're <laughs> legit one of the most authentic and genuine content creators and, and coaches that I follow. I love all of your emails. I read them religiously. I forward them to friends. I think you give so much value for free. Uh, and, you know, everyone who is listening um, knows that that's what I'm all about. You know, I love to lead with value with my YouTube channel and I got no time for any BS in this whole world of marketing. Um, and so when I meet someone with a like-minded view on this whole world, I like to introduce them to my people um, so that they can share their wisdom with you and help you on your journey, whether it be copywriting or any other type of freelancing. I know a lot of you on here are either copywriters or aspiring copywriters, um, but Jay is the real deal. He is the creator of Freelancing School, which provides training and support to help uh, people make a living with freelancing. So he has courses, coaching, and an online community. Um, and he gives creatives the tools they need to thrive as business owners. He's been featured on lynda.com, TEDx, um, South by Southwest, LinkedIn, uh, and more. He's also the founder of the Unreal Collective, which hosts a 12-week online accelerator for creative business owners. And he's the author, uh, an author for LinkedIn Learning, which covers freelancing, entrepreneurship, and product management. So what's up, Jay? Hello. Thank you. That was thorough. That was uh, a good job of research on your part. So thank you. For, yeah, I, I, I memorized it all too. Wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to give a little plug because you are launching a podcast tomorrow, right? Yes. It's been a long time coming. It's called Creative Elements. Um, would love to share a link to that uh, later on, but that's not why we're here today. So I won't waste your time right now, but I'm very Well, excited I'll make about... sure to give a shout out on my IG tomorrow because I know you've put so much love into it. And you've interviewed people like Seth Godin and... Yep. Yeah. Like... Tomorrow, tomorrow we have Seth Godin. Next week we have James Clear. Talk about um... a, an amazing person to kick off a podcast with, like no big deal. Um, <laughs> but I will make sure just to everyone listening... Um, I will share a link in my IG tomorrow since tomorrow is like the inaugural, inaugural, that's a really hard word to say, inaugural podcast episode um, <laughs> called Creative Elements. And so, um, yeah, I think, Michael, what's up? I'm so proud of all, look at all my, all my Copy Posse Launchpad students representing up in the house. Okay, so Represent. I want to share a little bit about how this training came to be. And it's, I think it's just a testament to the type of person that Jay is. Um, so I sent out an email last week. I think it was to my video sharing five copywriting courses that you could study from home right now. And I, you know, I made reference to like the craziness that's going on in the world right now. Um, and I think as, as leaders and content creators in the industry, we really sort of 
you need to lead the charge on the type of conversations and what's being said and, and what's happening right now, especially for the people who look up to us and, and want to know kind of, okay, like, how do I navigate this? And, um, you know, I was mentioning this actually to my students uh, earlier this week is like, how grateful are we that we can connect online um, every single, you know, twice a week over Zoom and, and be able to support one another and connect and grow and learn. Um, and that, you know, not everyone has that privilege right now, but the fact that all of you guys are on here on this webinar right now is so cool because one, it shows me the type of people that you are, where you're committed to learning and growing and doing something different, um, which is like mad props. Um, but we're all affected by this craziness, like so differently, right? So some of us already work from home. And so while, you know, it's definitely a disrupt disruption, it, it doesn't feel as different as say, you know, the healthcare workers who are out there or the city workers or, um, you know, the people who are running and doing work so that we can stay at home and be safe. So I want to just give mad props um, to all of you. Actually, Greg, who's listening right now, he's a healthcare worker. And um, honestly, there's so many people in his position who are just busting their asses for us. And so big shout out to all of them, first of all. Sure. Um, and we're all affected by this so differently. I mean, some of us have kids. I mean, I don't, but some of us have kids who are out of school and all of a sudden you're finding yourself at home like, oh my gosh, I have to work now at home and manage children. Like, oh my gosh, some of us um, have lost jobs. Some of us have, you know, are just completely, you know, in disarray, not knowing how to handle sort of what's going on. And it's all pretty crazy. And Jay reached out to me and was like, Alex, how can we help people right now? Like, how can we do a training or do something where we can just share anything we can to to help the freelancers and the copywriters and and those of us who are in sort of the client business client getting client business um to get ahead because the whole world right now is basically coming to a screeching halt and that's actually a huge opportunity for a lot of us and i know it can be so easy to like numb out and binge watch netflix and i definitely watched all of rupaul's all stars <laughs> on netflix in the past couple of weeks um and that's fine you know but it's so easy to numb out and you know the fact that you guys are here on this webinar means that you're willing to do something productive to hopefully get get ahead and we're going to do all we can to sort of offer our guidance and and help out um so you know i'm going to be monitoring the chat throughout um this webinar i'm also going to be looking at questions during the q a um if anything's super relevant in the moment i will jump in and ask your question for you uh to jay in the Q&A box, but like I said, we'll also open the lineup for questions at the end um, so that you can actually get on and, and join us and ask a question. But essentially over the next you know hour, you're going to learn Jay's nine tips for finding clients right now, what you can do from home to really not only sort of, you know, get ahead from a business perspective, but also just deal with all the craziness and, and, and insanity that's happening right now. Um, and why freelancing actually puts you at a huge advantage, uh, I think, right now during these uncertain times. I know, um, you know, when, when you're a freelancer or, or entrepreneur, it feels so uncertain. But when you can build a business despite uncertainty, because uncertainty becomes the constant, you actually kind of make yourself, you know, what's, what's the word? you're sort of proofing yourself against, you know, what's happening in the outer world because you're get, you're given the tools and you're learning the tools to be able to have a solid foundation. So when, you know, excuse my language, when shit hits the fan, because, you know, it does. And it has. It yeah. has. Yeah. You feel prepared <laughs> to, um, to make that happen. So, um, yeah, so I said it, I said it before I'm a, you know, copywriter and a copywriting expert. Uh, I'm not a freelancing expert. Uh, I can definitely do my best to share with you guys, my strategy, skills, practices on how I've gotten clients over the years, but that's really why I wanted to bring, um, Jay to, to you guys to share, um, you know, he works with freelancers in so many different areas and he has a lot of amazing wisdom that he can share. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's good, Jay. I'm, I think we're ready for you to kick off your, your slides and we'll go from there. All right. Okay. Well, can you see my screen, Alex? Just give me a thumbs up if you can. I can awesome. see them. Awesome guys. Well, like Alex said, um, kudos to you for taking the time to, uh, making the time for this training and for showing up and being interested and continuing to push forward in a difficult time. Um, 
my name is Jay, like Alex said, and she gave me such a great intro that I barely even need to touch on any of this. But suffice it to say that I work with a lot of artists and creatives, people who have taken the leap either full-time or part-time into freelancing. And it's usually because they want control. They want control of their life. They want control of their time. And if you don't go into it really intentionally and thoughtfully and prepared for building a business, uh, you can very quickly find yourself feeling overworked and underpaid. And a lot of times personal projects that you were excited to work on, that's why you went freelance in the first place, those things fall by the wayside. Um, and so I work with a lot of my clients to help them find balance and accomplish the professional goals that they have, but also reserve some time for their personal projects. So, you know, this is a tough time for everyone. Let me just start by saying that this is tough for everyone. Uh, and I just want you to know and to feel that you are not alone in whatever it is that you're feeling throughout all of this. Whatever you're feeling is valid. Uh, it's a scary time. It's a stressful time. Some days it's really hard to get out of bed and do things. You're not alone in feeling that way. Um, but you know, I'm here to tell you that just because it feels like the world around you may have slowed down and client work has slowed down, that doesn't mean that you have to slow down if you don't want to. It doesn't mean that you need to sit here and let the world happen to you. You can be proactive and you can start to make some of your own breaks and make some of your own luck. So I'm here to say, you know, we've got some lemons right now. Everyone's been given a pile of lemons, mm -hmm. but we can make some lemonade. So um, everybody ready to dive in and, and <laughs> see what some are of these strategies ready? are. Are you ready? Type yes if you are ready to make some freaking lemonade. It always takes Let's a couple of seconds. Lemonade. It feels, yeah, it feels like you're like yelling into an empty room. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, amazing. We are going to make some awesome. tastiest, yeah, lemonade known to man. Love it. Awesome, awesome. So before I even get into these nine strategies, um, talking to Alex before we got on here, I wanted to set some, some base level context and make sure we're starting from the same place. If you haven't gotten a ton of clients before, maybe you're looking for your first client, I wanted to explain... Uh, how I think about sales funnel and sales process and what that means for you at this stage. Even if you have clients already and you've worked with some folks, this is going to be a really helpful exercise and framework for you to be thinking about how to talk about your own work, how to talk about yourself and go out and get some more clients. So this is a basic visualization, right? Everyone that you meet uh, before they can ever buy from you, and that's the bottom of the funnel, before they can ever buy from you, they have to know you exist. It just makes common sense. If they don't know you exist, there's no way that they're going to become a client. So the first stage is awareness. Once they're aware of you, at some point, they're going to get interested in working with you. Um, then sometime they're going to make a decision and finally take action and say, yes, Alex, here's my checkbook. I'm going to work with you. Mm -hmm. This is going to happen. It would be awesome if we could skip these first two steps and, and went straight to people making a decision whether or not they want to work with us. Yeah. And that's what referrals do for you. When someone has, um, when you get an inbound lead for somebody, when you have someone coming to you and asking for help because someone else has referred them to you, they have already become aware of you. They're already interested enough that they've asked for a, rep, for a referral or for an introduction. And that's why referrals are so powerful. Because you and then skip. they have trust built in too. Totally, totally. You skip the hardest part of the funnel where the most people fall out and you go right to the part of the process where it's most likely they're going to work with you anyway. Yeah, I actually have a quick question too for everyone listening. Like how many of you, and I've heard this a lot from, from a few people is, they're like, I tried sending out emails to, to people and like I don't hear anything back. And I think... I, again, I haven't read your emails, but I think a lot of people try to skip to the decision in action. Like they're taking cold leads um, and they're basically going, hey, here's what I can do by now or, you know, Definitely. get back to me and hire me. And, you know, I think there's, there's really something that needs to be, to be said for the top of the funnel and, and what you're actively doing to create that. People don't go all the way through your sales funnel and say, yes, I'm going to hire you upon a first impression but a first impression is necessary for them ever to decide to hire you. So if you're, if you're on LinkedIn and you're sending an automated message to your first connection to say, Hey, this is what I do. Will you hire me? Mm -hmm. You're going to have a very low close rate mm -hmm. because that's just a very strong start. So think about, you know, at the top of this funnel, you're starting and building relationships and then eventually you're going to have the opportunity to work with somebody. But again, the shortcut here is if you have someone 
uh, referred directly to you. And yeah. so I want to talk a little bit about uh, how to do that because life is easy when you have high quality inbound leads. It's really easy when people are coming to you for your help. And it's really important to remember someone else recommending your work is much more powerful than you recommending your work. Of course, you're going to say, I do really great work, but there's always going to be a little bit of a question in the client's mind of, are they just saying that because it's them and they have to? When a third party, someone that should be fairly unbiased says, you got to work with Jay, you've got to work with Alex. That's really powerful. And it gets you uh, a lot of the way down that sales yeah. funnel. Social proof. <laughs> totally. So the more people that you have out there who are referring people to you, the better off you're going to be. The more advocates you have for your business, the easier your life will be. And so I want to talk a little bit about what an advocate is. And it's, it's pretty obvious, pretty intuitive. If you already receive word of mouth referrals, that word is coming from the mouth of your advocates, people who are willingly uh, saying nice things about you. It's your friends, it's your family, it's your coworkers, it's collaborators, people who already know you and are already saying nice things and being willing to go out, put their neck on the line and say, you should work with this person. These advocates can be a total, total game changer for you uh, if you value them appropriately, if you give them the right tools, and then if you utilize them correctly. correctly. And so the framework that I want to introduce here is something I call eyes and ears, which is kind of intuitive on the surface already. So it's both an acronym and a philosophy. Eyes stands for establish your elevator speech. Mm. And ears means empower advocates to refer sales. Nice. I'm going to break each of those down a little bit here real quick before you even get into these nine uh, these nine steps for getting <laughs> more clients. Awesome. So this is, yeah. this is an extended bonus. Um, let's start with the eyes. Your elevator speech or elevator pitch, P didn't work so well. I went with speech because I, P doesn't quite <laughs> work as well I, as eyes. My I, I, <laughs> uh, your elevator speech is a short description of what you do. In one breath, the goal should be, this is how you tell someone who you help and how you help them. It needs to be memorable. And the shorter and more specific it is, the better. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to get into that a little bit here. But if you uh, are just getting started, you don't have any clients, or if you have gotten some clients, but it still feels like it's more difficult than it should be, a really great place to start is by looking at your elevator speech and figuring out how do I describe what I do to people, especially your advocates. And a really great way to do that is the framework I help X do Y. I help this type of person solve this type of problem. Some examples here would be, I help, me personally, I help creatives make money freelancing. Right. Uh, maybe you help B2B SaaS companies write better emails. Maybe you take photos for destination weddings. Maybe you handle post-production for podcasters. Yeah, this is so, um, this is so similar to, I mean, when I speak in copywriting terms about determining, um, just your unique selling proposition as a copywriter. You know, I've said this in a couple of emails, guys, like when you reach out to people and say, hi, I'm a copywriter and I can write copy for you. What you're actually doing is creating a massive, um, task in the mind of your future potential client to try to figure out what they need you to help them with. And it's sort of like, Oh, great. Uh, you know what? I, I, I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know what I need right now. It's all very confusing. So being be, establishing your elevator speech and making it like you're doing here, super specific where you're calling out the audience and the specific problem and or benefit. I mean, it's, it's like applying the rules of copywriting to your own marketing materials when you are trying to get clients. Totally. We, we remember very specific terms when we're being an advocate for somebody else. And the unfortunate reality is people are going to put you in a box. And so the best thing you can do is create your own box to give to them to say, if you're going to think of me in any way, this is how I want you to do it. I help B2B SaaS companies write better emails. I help creatives make fun, make money or freelancing. It's the more specific you can be, the better. Um, mm -hmm. Because our memories are really terrible and you need to keep it short. <laughs> and so just a little bit more on specialization. I know you're going to resist it. You're not going to want to do it. You're not going to want to say, I help this specific type of person do the specific type of thing. You're going to think I can do all of the things 
how do I choose one or two of the things? But the reality is you have limited capacity. You won't do everything for anyone, for everyone. And if you try, you're going to end up doing nothing for anyone. Mm -hmm. And I always say that too, when you're writing copy, I think when I work with clients who, especially in, in more broad fields, like personal development or something, and I say, okay, what does your product help people do specifically who, and what does it do? They're like, well, it helps everyone just be happier and better. And, and it's like, what? That's not memorable. That's not unique. And so when it same, same goes for you and your skill set is, you know, when you try to appeal to everyone, you end up appealing to no one. Totally. Uh, you're going to end up chasing more people uh, and spending more time making less money than you've ever made before. And the thing is, it doesn't um, preclude you from doing other things. Even if you say, I help B2B SaaS companies write better emails. If someone comes up to you and says, can you help me with my testimonial page? You can still say yes. It's okay. Right. This is about the toolbox, the uh, elevator speech that you're allowing your advocates to go and run with for you. So pick whatever work uh, you want to do. Maybe it's kind of your bread and butter. Maybe it's the aspirational work. But, um, you know, be specific with what you want Absolutely. people referring people to you for. I always talk about that too in my videos where I say, pick your niche. Everyone's like, but well, I don't know what, what I want my niche to be. It's more, it's more for your client's benefit than it is for your benefit. Like you could decide you want to write copy in a specific niche and then you decide that you hate that niche, fine, then change it, you know? But if you're not clear uh, from the beginning, pe pe people don't know how you can specifically help them. So yeah, I love all this. Totally. So, you know, saying I write emails for B2B SaaS companies, much more specialized than I'm a copywriter. Um, right. And being specialized makes it a lot easier to be the go-to number one person for some type of customer. And being the go-to number one person means you can charge higher rates and it makes you a lot more referable. Mm -hmm. So let's dive into the second part of eyes and ears. Um, empower advocates to refer sales. These are the advocates I was talking about. There's this quote from the book Code of Trust by Robin Dreek that I like a lot. Robin Dreek was in the FBI um, and he was, you know, part of his job is building relationships with either people uh, out in the field that he needs to gain the trust of. But he said, a tenant of evolutionary psychology is that people are hardwired to enjoy offering assistance not only as a mechanism to receive assistance themselves, but also to satisfy the innate drive for altruism. Basically what he's saying here is, you know, every day people around you are out there talking to other people. Your advocates are out in the world talking to other people every day. And often in those conversations that they have with other people, that person they're talking to will talk about a problem they're facing or a pain point they're having because we're all kind of self-involved. And so when we talk about things, we talk about what we're struggling with. And when that happens, your advocate is going to try and solve that problem for them. They're going to figure out, okay, this person is in pain or this person's having a problem. How do I solve that for them? And often they solve that by recommending someone that they know can help solve that problem. So you want to be the first person they think of when they're solving somebody's problem. Mm -hmm. And the best way to do that is being specialized, being specific, because you're going to be the first person in mind. You're going to be that go-to referral. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep using this example because I think it's <laughs> really it's a useful. good one. Stick with one it. My, yeah. One of my clients uh, does this and she gets a ton of referrals because of this. Um, when someone says, you know, I need someone to help me write better emails. If someone's pitch said, I help this type of company write better emails, they're going to remember that phrase. Yeah. Same if they say, hey, I run a B2B SaaS company, I need help with this. They're going to think, who do I know that helps B2B SaaS companies? Yeah. Specialized words are easy to remember and easy for an advocate to make a connection. And the first person who comes to mind is going to get that referral. If someone says I need a copywriter, I'm going to think of 10 people off the top of my head and I'm going to make my own second leap to say, which is the person that I should totally. plug in here? And if you haven't given me the elevator speech or the box that you want me to use for you, I'm going to make some assumptions and I might yeah. make some wrong assumptions. Yeah. The point that always, that's so, so important. Like I can't tell you the number of times I have my mastermind members or um, clients or partners or friends say, Hey Alex, do you know? Um, Cause you know, normally I, my agency's full. I can't take any on any more clients. And then they say, do you know anybody who writes copy or who can write copy for me? And then the first question I always ask is sure. What kind of copywriter do you need?
the biggest assumption is that all copywriters are created equal. And I think that's also part of the reason why when people, they always, at least in my world, no one can find a copywriter, which seems crazy for all of mm. you guys who want to be copywriters. It just goes to show that there's so much room for specialty. And, you know, it's part of the reason why I ask my, my Copy Posse Launchpad students to pick a niche. Because when I then have um, clients and students come, or sorry, clients and partners come ask me, hey, do you know a copywriter in, in this area, in this area, in this area, in this area? I can say, absolutely. Yes, I do. And so it's just totally. so, so powerful. And, and, and you're not stuck to that specialty forever. You can change right. if you really decide that you no longer want to do that. Yep, 100%. Um, so remember, you already have advocates, people that can go out there and refer you. It's your clients, your friends, your family, people who admire your work. They will become productive advocates if you give them these tools, if you give them this elevator speech. By using that same specific elevator speech around them, you begin to use repetition to your advantage and just lodges in their brain, and they can refer some people to you. Mm. And that's what the ears is all about. Once you've established that, memorize it use the same phrase every time I help creatives make money freelancing. I say that all the time because then people start to remember it. They start to refer people to me because of it over time. It sticks in their minds. And at any given time, if you have more and more advocates, just think about this as a numbers game, the more people that you pull into your world who are going to be positive advocates, source of referrals for you at any given time, they might be out in the world solving somebody's problem for them. And that problem solve might be you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know we had br briefly talked about this before the call, but you know, if you're kind of thinking, well, who are my advocates? And I know you're going to talk about this, but, um, you know, even if imagine if you just posted on your Facebook page, hi, I'm, uh, a copywriter who, um, or I write, I help, sorry, I'm trying to use your formula. <laughs> I <laughs> help these sort of uh, companies write this sort of copy is there anybody that could use my services right now? You would be so surprised how many people might not immediately go, yes, I know someone, but maybe in a week or in two weeks or in three weeks, they're like, where did I see that? Oh yeah. Plus how often do people ask you, you know, Hey, how can I help you? And it's really easy then because if you've done the work to say, do you know any B2B SaaS companies? You know, you don't have to say, do you know any of these type of people who need this type of help? You can start by saying, do you know any of these type of people? And then you can have a conversation with them that gets mm -hmm. them up to the awareness stage of your sales funnel and you're starting to build a relationship. So, you know, having this framework in place helps you um, better spend your time and even take advantage of a lot of the very generous and kind asks that people make all the time. You know, when someone says, what do you do? We get so afraid of that, but it's an invitation to actually, you know, build a referral mechanism if you approach yeah. it that way. And it's so simple. Everyone can come up with, I help blank do blank. You know, it's so simple and it doesn't, how many times do you guys go to networking events? And someone's like, yes, hi. And what do you do? Especially when you're in that weird middle um, place between leaving a nine to five job or wanting to leave a nine to five job and starting your business. And you're like, well, I'm at this networking event because I really want to start my business, but technically I don't do that yet. Uh, what do, how do I say this? How do I answer this question? So if you're an aspiring copywriter and you go to an, a networking event and someone says, what do you do? You can say, oh, I'm a copywriter. I help these types of businesses write these kind of, this type of type of copy or these type of emails um, or this type of, you know, upsell page or, you know, these types of product descriptions or whatever it might be. Um, and actually, this is a good segue. Suze is asking, so what are your thoughts on using referral networks like BNI or I take the lead? Not sure if they're shifting to virtual meetings now or not, though. Um, I have next to no familiarity with either of those. I mean, at the end of the day, if it's working for you, awesome. If you're putting a ton of time into it and it's not working for you, not great. Um, I find that the best referrals come from people who aren't, um, who don't feel like just obligated to do it. It gets, it kind of starts relationships on a weird footing. But yeah. to be honest, I don't know either of those networks very well. Uh, I try to operate as one-to-one, um, -one, human to human as I possibly can, because to me, um, I've just seen a greater return on that um, 
because I'm just very bullish on personal relationships. Yeah, me too. And I think I think the like BNI and I and I've never heard of I take the lead, but I, I get the concept of BNI. And I think you know if you're already established in one, then why not? But there's also so many local meetups and things. You can go to meetup.com and find local entrepreneurship meetups and different networking events that really allow you to kind of get in front of other business owners um, who will always need coffee. Um, and Bree's asking, God, what if you're so green and you don't know what you do or who you can help? Um, I mean, I'll answer from my perspective. I think, you know, you can really take a second to, to think about who you want to help and what you want to do. And um, to be honest, I think that's, all, that's a lot how we all are when we're just getting started. And as long as we're really honest about where we're at. So when you are going and reaching out to a client, you can say, you know, I'm just getting started, but I'm super passionate about this. And I, I'm... I'm starting a, a freelance copywriting business where I help blank do blank. You know, I think for me, it's always like being super, um, just real and honest with where you're at, because then that appeals to people's need to want to help and support you as well. Like we were talking about. Yeah. That's a really great strategy for getting started. And I would also say be aspirational, you know, to what you're just saying, saying Alex, because what people don't tell you, uh, in the beginning is that bad clients attract other bad clients. And good clients attract other good clients. So the more aspirational you can be in the beginning and say, this is the type of work I want to do. These are the type of clients I want to work with. Uh, it may take you six, 12 months to get that first client that really fits exactly what you're trying to do. But mm -hmm. that person is then going to become a referral source for other people like them. And yeah. um, it just kind of builds upon itself. So the, the more upfront you can say, you know what? No, this is what I want to do. This is who I want to help. Even if it seems like a reach at the time, yeah. You'd be surprised, you, you know, don't undervalue your skills. Um, they're going to be people in that, in a position to hire you that just don't have the skill set that you do and they'll take a chance on you. Yeah. And one more question I know, cause it's just related. Yusuf says, Alex, in your videos, you talk about the first, how the first client sets the foundation. So what if you choose a niche that you end up not liking? Will that affect your future work? Similar to what Jay was just saying, you know, it does set the foundation because once you have one client that you have a good relationship with, then, you know, you can build your, your, your business based on referrals, but it's not that you can't completely change it. And I know that this is a real concern because a lot of my students also express this and they go, well, what if I want to write in tech? And then all of a sudden I realize like, no, I want to write for this. And that's totally fine. You know, specializing just gives you an extra little oomph when you are looking for very specific clients. But if you are, are reaching out um, and you have a portfolio from a year and a half ago with unrelated copy, no one's going to like call your you know, shit, they're just, they're going to be like, Oh, okay. He used to do that. So I would say, don't stress about it. Like your most important thing is just to get started. Totally. It's uh, it's not a prison sentence and it's not a life right. sentence. You know, you can exactly. always change it and you control your portfolio. So if you want to stop showing off some type of work, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right. So we've gotten to the beginning now of these nine steps. Are you guys ready to get on with yes! the show and do the actual Give stuff? Nine about? steps. All right. Awesome. So let's start by reaching out to your advocates, these people we just talked about. Uh, there's a lot of talk right now about social distancing and physical distancing is really important right now. So we can flatten the curve here in the U.S. and all across the world and not spread this virus. But we don't need social distance, in my opinion. We need social connection while maintaining physical distance. So there are a lot of people right now uh, who are feeling very lonely and disconnected and have a lot of time on their hands that they didn't before. It's a really great time to reconnect with friends, family, coworkers, and other advocates. Reach out to them, have a conversation over the phone, schedule a video call. You know, this is a really good time to fill um, with building relationships with some of these people that you already think of as advocates for you. And when you talk to them, be empathetic, you know, talk to them about their situ situation, see if there's any way that you can help them ask them how they're doing. You know, it's not it's not all about business here. It's about strengthening the relationship that you built in the first place that made them your advocate. At some point, they'll probably ask you how you're doing. And you should be upfront with them, you should be honest, let them know how the situation has impacted you. Uh, what types of things would make it easier on you? You know, maybe it is finding a client who is a B2B SaaS company. Maybe it is finding someone who needs help rewriting some of their emails. Um, maybe you just need pure emotional support and that's okay to ask for. Yeah. Do your, do your part to help others and others will likely do what they can to help you, you know, back to what Robin Dreek says, but only if they know how they can help. So don't just say everything's great and, and make it all 
rainbows and sunshine, you know, be honest, ask for help and do it with humility. These people mm -hmm. are your advocates. And, you know, another acronym that I like to think of that's not in this deck anywhere else is ABCs. People are going to be an advocate for you before they're a client. Mm -hmm. Even if they very quickly become an advocate or be very quickly become a client, they're going to advocate to themselves that they should hire you. Right. So, you know, before anything else, you need to build a relationship to a point where someone is willing to be an advocate for you, even if it is to themselves or their boss. I love that advocate before client. Yeah, that's so, so powerful. And I think too, like the other thing to say um, to this is when you get really clear on what it is that you offer and guys, you can refine it over time because I know now you're kind of thinking, Oh, is what I'm saying specific enough? Like start with something and then, um, and then you can always like, you know, whittle it down and you'll, you'll know by the response, but or you can go the other way and start super specific and then and then once you start working with particular types of clients maybe you pivot or change where you're going um but think about how hard it is to um think about how hard it is to just like when you're in a facebook group for example and they're like no self-promotion and they don't want people to go hey here's what i do like and it's because it seems it seems pitchy and you're, you know, just trying to get business. But with, when you're talking to your advocates and someone's genuine, like genuinely asking you how you're doing and you can share that, then you're putting that seed out there in a lot of different ways. And so you don't have to only rely on, you know, I think everyone's thinking, Oh, I got to go get clients in a Facebook group or I got to go to Upwork or I got to, that's where I got to do it. I mean, the, the people who are your advocates will be the ones who refer your work. A few years ago when I was just getting started, I totally misunderstood how cash flow worked. And it got to the end of the year and I realized, oh crap, I don't even have like the money to get through the end of this year. And I'm not spinning up another um, cohort of the accelerator until January. Mm. And so the first thing I did was reach out to people who are close to me. I asked them how I could help them. Um, and over and over, I was just like, you know, I, I shared what I was excited about first. I said, this is really exciting work on these things. It's going really well. But um, I totally mishandle my cash flow. And so cash is a little dry right now. I'm looking to help somebody with uh, their email copy or with some websites. And um, it only took a few of those meetings with my advocates for someone to be like, oh, I need that. You know, yeah. here's, can I hire you for the next three months? Uh, and it was, it was exactly what I needed. And it just came from being open and honest and, and talking to people who already cared uh, about me and were invested in my success. Mm -hmm. All right, number two, reach out to former and existing clients if you have them, or even people who are uh, warm leads, potential clients. With all the bad news you're seeing, you might assume that business is coming to a standstill and everyone is just guarding their money, putting it into a vault so that no one can touch it. Uh, and that's not totally the case. Uh, just this past week, I had one of my best weeks in months because I said, oh, the storm's coming. I guess it's a good time for me to try to rein in some of these warm leads that I've been, you know, keeping in touch with for the past couple months, this is the time to try and strike and get, get some work in the boat. Um, a lot of these businesses have very real needs mm -hmm. and those needs may be even more difficult to fill right now that things are remote. So if you offer services virtually, you may be at a big advantage right now. It's worth reaching out to and checking in with your existing former and potential clients to see if they could use a hand. Yeah, actually that just gave me a really good idea. Like, um, because my, this is a thing in my own life. My boyfriend has a brick and mortar woodworking business where he builds furniture and wood products. And he's been talking for months about building his Shopify store and hasn't done it because he's been busy like everybody right now. He's forced to stay at home. And I'm like, Hey babe, good time to start your Shopify store. <laughs> guess who wrote, go guess who helped him write his copy. But imagine yeah. if you could reach out to some of the local businesses in your area who you know are probably struggling to get online right now and you can help them with, with putting and building an online Shopify store. I mean, it's literally plug and play. Anyone who's ever used Shopify, it's like easier than using Facebook, I swear. Um, but there's just so much opportunity. It's just knowing where you can come in and actually help. It's not opportunistic if you're genuinely helping this business that would otherwise not make sales bring their sales online like that's that's huge totally and i was thinking along the lines of you know they're still moving forward with their initiatives externally but a lot of them might be focusing in-house they might be saying things are slow it's time for us to redo our website it's time for us to get you know some attention on that um yeah. 
you know, support center for, for our product. So it's worth reaching out and seeing like, hey, what are you guys doing? Are you focusing internally? Can I help you with these things? Mm-hmm. Um, to, to underscore the example of this being a good time for people virtually, this is a tweet I saw that hit the nail on the head. She basically said, you know, if your company needs creative and they usually use photographers or filmmakers to go on site to shoot, but you can't go on site right now, you could hire an illustrator or an animator. You know, there are people yeah. who have a way of doing things that is disrupted right now and they're looking for solutions. Absolutely. Here's, uh, here's a template email that I have for you guys. And, you know, we'll send this deck out after, after um, the, the webinar here so that you can, you can have this. But basically reach out to this person and say, hi, person, how are you holding up? You know, start with empathy. Start with asking them how they're doing. If you've done work with them in the past, you know, say, I was thinking about you and the work we did together at this time, maybe it was last May, maybe it was last September. Let them know that you were grateful for the opportunity to work with them and that you would like to support them now if their opportunity is there and if if they need it. Um, Let them know that, you know, you're looking ahead for your own business and you're trying to be mindful of your own time. Say, I wanted to reach out to you sooner than later. You know, make make it seem like you're busy. People like to work with busy people. But say, I want to touch with you sooner rather than later. I've had a good year and I'm booking up my calendar into April and May. Are you available to catch up over the phone and talk about your plans? You don't even need to make a big pitch here. Just, you know, as if they're your, one of your advocates say, I want to get on the phone and talk. You know, mm-hmm. can you catch up over the phone and talk about it? Do you have time? They probably have time. Yeah. And if you start that phone call, asking them a lot of questions about what's going on in their world, you might hear them express a problem that you know you can solve. So if you get them on the phone and you get them talking about their problems, if you hear something that you can fix for them, you know, you can offer that at the end of the call and say, hey, you mentioned that um, you're getting a lot of customer service emails right now asking what's going on. You don't have the capacity to answer all of them. Do you want me to answer some emails for you? Mm-hmm. You know, like you, you may have to be a little bit flexible, but, you know, it's it's a good time to try new things. It's a good time to... Um, learn new skills as we'll talk about here shortly. Yeah, absolutely. I'll wait. I was going to add something to that, but I, I know it's coming. So I'll wait. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, third, third tip here is to make specific offers. When you're having conversations with people, it's good to have a very specific offer that you can proactively make for them. Um, making an offer means coming to the table with a defined outcome or a scope of a project, the price of the project and so on. The more specific you can be about uh, this thing that you basically make it feel plug and play. If they just say yes, the the better off that you're going to be. You don't want your client using their imagination. Uh, Alex and I have talked. If you just say, hey, I'm a copywriter. Do you need any of that? They have to think like, well, I don't know. What does yeah. that refer to? What What could I do with them? If you go in and you say something like, instead of do you have any copywriting needs? You say, I'm going to work with five clients this month to write some case studies of their former uh, customers are you interested in that? That's much more specific. That's something people can wrap their head around and they can just say yes or no. If they just say, yeah, get started. You've done all the imagination work for them. Yeah. Or, Hey business, you know, I know it's a tough time right now. If you're interested in, in bringing your store online and selling your products online, I'll set up your Shopify store and write your, um, you know, homepage copy plus five emails that you can send out to your mailing list for this much money. Oh, you don't have a mailing list. I'll set up your MailChimp account for you too. You know, like we're all copywriters, but we all know how to use online tools. Y'all made it on Zoom. So um, like thinking outside the box, you know, and offering a package like that. How many business owners would be like, oh, oh my God, that's what I need exactly right now, you know? Totally. Alex, you had that great example of uh, the person who reached out to you about video. Did oh, you that? yes. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I am looking for an additional video editor. And uh, I honestly, I was sort of stressed out by the whole thought of, having to go on Upwork or try to find somebody. And uh, this guy sent me an email who was just like, hey, by the way, um, I have a video editing package. I'll edit four videos a month, up to 20 minutes long, uh, 48 hour turnaround time and limited revisions for only 450 bucks a month. I, I can't remember if that was the exact price, but it was like, Oh my gosh, thank you for being so specific. He overcome my immediate objections because immediately I'm like, okay, well, how many revisions does that include? Or um, what's the timeline? Or um, how many videos does that include a month? And he just laid it all out on the table and I had never met or heard of the guy before. 
Um, but he just got really clear on what his offer was and reached out to people who he thought might need it. I'm sure he gets more no's than yeses, but I might consider hiring him just because of that. And think about how much shorter that makes the sales cycle. You know, you're going to naturally get no's a lot all the time anyway, but a quick no is better than a prolonged no. Totally. So if you're, if you're there saying, this is exactly what I can do for you, um, even if you say no, it's like, okay, on to the next person. Yeah. But more times than not, people might say yes. And if they say yes, that project is getting started a week, two weeks, three weeks faster than it would if you had to go back and forth talking about, well, how many revisions? What is the price? What are we doing? When you come and have basically a productized service to offer, it's, it's a pretty cut and dry yes or no, and you can get things started pretty quickly. Absolutely. So I want to dive in a little bit more about why the psychology of that works too. And the first reason is uh, scarcity. People are attracted to things that are rarer or harder to attain. You know, It's the reason why we have museums with paintings by Van Gogh that are priceless and you can also go buy a print for it for like $5. You know, we don't care about the print. We care about the scarce version of the thing. We care about something that is hard to attain. So if you're building yourself up to be uh, someone that only works with five clients a month and people start to uh, notice that you do great work and you're in demand, they're going to want to be that person that has the ability to hire you. So if you make yourself seem scarce, if you make your offers seem scarce, that's really good for you. And the second lever at play there in an offer is urgency. People tend to leave off making decisions until they're forced to make a decision. And the thing that forces decisions better than anything else is a deadline. So mm -hmm. if you give someone a deadline for when they need to accept that offer, they're going to give you a yes or a no, but you're at least going to know when it's coming. Yeah. And more times than not, you know, if something is scarce, if it's well-defined and it's an opportunity sitting right in front of me, all I have to do is say yes. I'm more likely to say yes. Yeah. I think that's so huge because we're all inherent procrastinators by nature, right? I, I've given this example to my students before, but it's like, if you're like, hey, look at this lipstick, I'll sell it to you for $100 now, or you can just buy it for $100 later. Everyone's going to pick later. Nobody wants to yeah. lose the money now. Like, let me um, think about it. Yeah, exactly. Or you get, yeah, you get the, well, I reached out. I have a lot of irons in the fire, but I haven't heard back from anybody yet. You have to give them a reason why they need to get back to you right away. Um, you know, and keep it short and sweet. Emails that I get where I have to scroll more than once, I, I'm sorry, guys, I just don't answer. Um, because I, you know, nobody has time to read, read novels. And I, I mean, I do, obviously, if I know the person and there's rapport there already, but any emails I get from just random people, um, and I do try to read all my emails, but if they're too long or too, you know, convoluted, I just won't respond. But if someone gets back to me, presents it on the table, give me a yes or no by this date, I probably would say no most of the time, but at least you know then. And every yeah. now and then you send out, you know, you set 10 or 20 emails, you're going to get a yes eventually. A standard line in my um, follow-ups to, to people who seem like a warm lead and might be a client. At this point, when I follow up to them, I just basically say, hey, I wanted to follow up on this conversation we had last month, two months ago. I'm uh, lining up my March or my April. And I wanted to make sure that if you want to move on this project, I could budget time for it. Can we get on a call and talk about it? Mm -hmm. When you say, you know, I want to budget time for that, that gives the implicit statement of I'm busy and I don't mm -hmm. need you, but I want to make time for you if you're ready to move. You know, it's, it's almost generous, but yeah. it's creating that urgency and that scarcity. All I time. love that. Um, okay, so number four, this isn't a tip And by the way, oh, sorry to interrupt, Gabe. when you see links, guys, we're going to give you the slides, so you'll be able to go actually click on the link. So if you're like, wait, how do I click? <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll give you, uh, I'll be sending out the, an email with uh, links to yeah. uh, the replay recording and any of the resources and slides and things below, just so you know. Uh, next, next couple of steps here aren't necessarily uh, getting a new client, but it's something that can make this quiet time very productive and positive for you. And, and you'll understand more about that here in a second. The first thing that I would recommend doing is revisit your budget. And if you don't have a budget, this is a great time to create a budget. You know, mm -hmm. ideally you continue to sign new clients and life will go on as usual, but it's a really good idea to revisit your budget and see what you might be able to cut out for the foreseeable future. Things like subscriptions that you don't use, um, things like, yeah, I mean, subscriptions are going to be the number one offender, but you can also see, you know, right now we're not going out to eat as much maybe. And so what does that mean? How much money can we save per month if we really mm -hmm. focus on just buying groceries and, and stretching this out? 
if you don't have a budget in place, this is a really good time to do it. It helps you figure out exactly what you're spending money on every month and how much you're spending. And that will help you identify some of those line items you can cut back on or cut out entirely. And the reason that's important is if you save a hundred dollars a month, that's just as effective as signing a $1,200 client over the next year, even more effective because that $1,200 client, you're going to pay taxes on that income. So if yeah. you can save a hundred dollars a month right now, that's really powerful. That's just as powerful as finding another client. Mm -hmm. And I know we're all creatives and the idea of a budget makes us all squirm. Trust me, me too. I think, I think we even lost a couple people when you said the word budget. <laughs> <laughs> But honestly, guys, like what's so important about this too is it actually allows you to see what, like, what is that number that you're trying to replace with your freelancing income, right? Like, totally. what is the bare minimum that you need to replace so that you can then focus like on the upside after that and be able to maybe step away from your nine to five or whatever that looks like for you. This is a screenshot of part of the budget spreadsheet that I make available in my um, business for freelancers course. It can be really simple. It's easy for you to replicate this part of it at least. You know, you can have your expense name, how much you're spending on it per month, what does that mean for per year, when it's billed to you, whether it's a personal expense or a business expense. Eventually, you get down to this total where you can look at, this is a total monthly budget for me. This is a total that I'm spending every year. This is what I need to survive this year. And then you can start to back into even your overall revenue goal for your business because you can layer on things like, okay, I'm depositing this much into my wealth front and this much into an IRA. And I want to just reserve $500 a month for stuff that I can't even anticipate. That helps you figure out, okay, what is the post-tax income that I need to be earning? And if I estimate um, this much tax, this is my gross revenue goal. Yeah. I don't even remember all the steps to get here. This is a calculator that I built, uh, which I <laughs> promise is a real, but um, get a budget in place to at least understand what your costs are every month. Because even if you are aspiring to be a six figure copywriter, Alex and I were talking about this. If you're aspiring to be a six figure copywriter and you get there and you're making a hundred thousand dollars in your freelance business, but you're spending $75,000 a year to survive. That's worse than if you're making $60,000 and spending $30,000 a year to survive. Mm -hmm. It's it's more impactful for you if you can expand your own margins. And that starts by understanding where you're spending money. Absolutely. And, and just what that transition looks like. Because to be a six-figure copywriter, I mean, guys, I think I made like the, my very first month copywriting, I made like $600, you know, and I was paying, like they could barely afford my rent. And luckily my friend's dad was letting me stay at, at their place for a while. And, you know, it's, it's not this like, oh my God, I'm going to start a business and charge $10,000 a sales letter. But knowing your numbers give you that, that roadmap of like, okay, if this is what I need at a bare minimum every single month, here's how much I get for my nine to five. So to start, I'm just going to focus on getting one client a month for the next three months. And then I'm going to work up from that. And then you can kind of reach that level of like, this is my goal to when I can like fully step into this business. I know we all dream of the like, I quit moment where we're like, F work and jobs. I'm just going to like start my business. And it's very romantic. And I can tell you right now that that's not how it goes for most people. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Got to be strategic. All right. Uh, number five, you know, we talked about earlier, some of these clients that you're reaching out to, they may be getting their, their house in order internally. This is a good time for you to get your house in, in order internally. And I don't mean literally your apartment, although you could great time to clean. Um, I mean, focusing on some of the things that, you know, you should have done a long time ago. If you've ever heard the phrase, the cobbler's kids has no shoes or the blacksmith's home has wooden knives. This describes a lot of freelancers and creatives that I know which is basically we do incredible, beautiful work for other people, for our clients. But when it comes to our own company, our own brand, our own website, our own emails, we often fall short. And so if you're a brand designer, maybe this is a good time to work on your own brand. If you're a copywriter, like many of you are, this may be a good time to look at your website copy or your email copy or start a newsletter. You know, we'll talk about or that. Start a blog. Time. Yeah. Yeah. If you're a website developer, good time to look at your own website. I think we could all work on our own website. I personally- Our website's ever really done. <laughs> <laughs> no, websites are never done. That's the trick. So the trick is you have to publish and then you continue to build on it. Cause it's totally. Never, oh it's my never, gosh, totally. It's never as good as you want. 
Um, I've completely rehashed my personal site. I learned how to use gradients in Photoshop this week. So I got real gradient happy on the background of my site. <laughs> Looks beautiful. Good job. <laughs> right? It's bright and inviting. Uh, <laughs> same with uh, the freelancing school site. Like I've overhauled all of my websites this week because I have the time. Even some, nice. of, my, some of my emails. Renata says the comment on saving $100 a month is like gaining a $1,200 client a year. That's mind blowing. Thanks for the perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, good. And Ty, Ty says the concept of budgeting applies to your time and energy and attention as well. Uh, Hell to the yes, it so does. Totally, totally. I think one of the greatest skills you can learn is to be really lean and essential on how you're allocating all of your resources, your money, your time, your attention. It just prever preserves a lot of flexibility and optionality. Yeah. Oh, just like cutting out the, the BS, cutting out the fluff, cutting out the unnecessary expenses. You know, I, I hate looking at finances. It's like, I think it's like built in me as a creative, but I've made it part of my process where every month I go over my credit card bill and I'm like, I canceled my Netflix account because honestly, it just wasn't worth it. I'm like, you know what? I don't need it. Like I like be doing this kind of stuff and learning with you guys way better than I like watching Netflix. Plus my boyfriend has a Netflix account that I'm on sometimes. So, um, um, I do like watching RuPaul. <laughs> um, and you know, I think just looking at where you can really trim, trim down your expenses is huge. And I know, and then, and then spending that time on like a Squarespace account or, or that time and money on a Squarespace account or getting a personal website or blog set up. Right. I mean, you can offset that cost really easily. If you feel like your house is in order and you're trying to figure out what else you can layer on, I really recommend checking out Growth Tools by Brian Harris. Uh, they give you on their homepage, you can just click this refresh button. It gives you all of these action guides of the video explaining how to do it, step-by-step -step, things you can do. Um, it helped me with my, my opt-ins. It helped me with my website design. It helped me with social shares on some of this stuff. Uh, it's a really great tool and it's just at growthtools.com. Um, all and you know what, really like use this as inspiration to reach out to your clients. If you're like, how can I help clients like use this and be like, Oh, I didn't know that that's like, that's will help boost your conversions. Okay. I'm going to reach out to clients and say, I'm going to do ask for three social stars in your top three. Thank you pages say, Hey, I'm going to optimize three of your thank you. I'm going to optimize your, your thank you pages. There's a super cool. specific deliverable that you can offer and you can get ideas from growth tools. I think this is, I had never heard of this genius, genius resource. They just redid this website. It's, it's all brand new. Amazing. Um, perfect segue into number six, which is learning a new skill. This is maybe the best opportunity you've had in a long time to develop a new skill. So anything that you've been meaning to learn and you just haven't had the time, uh, you might have some time right now. This can give you another skill that you can leverage with new clients. Just like Alex was saying, you know, if you're using the growth tool stuff for your own work, now that becomes a tool in your tool belt that you can offer a client. Mm -hmm. um, often value comes at the intersection of skills. So you can be an amazing copywriter, but what if you're an amazing copywriter and you knew a little bit of marketing? What if you're an amazing copywriter and you could help build these Shopify sites for some of these clients? Mm -hmm. When you can combine skill sets and layer them on top of each other, it becomes harder to compete with you. You can do a lot more for your clients and make yourself uh, more essential to keep on the budget, you know, make it easier for them to keep you on retainer if you're doing some of these Absolutely. things on a recurring basis. Guys, um, that is so how I got started. I, my very first client, um, my very first retainer client, I was a project manager and basically did, you know, everything in between, you know, whatever they needed. And then I realized copywriting was such a huge gap in their organization that I just kind of started doing it. And then next thing you know, I'm writing copy for them and it's, and I'm learning as I'm, as I'm doing it and I'm still getting paid because it's not the only thing that I'm doing. And now, you know, now look at me. And so I, I actually just hired a social media manager not too long ago as well, who uh, wanted to get into copywriting and, but didn't have much experience. And she applied for a social media manager position. And now she's social doing social media management uh, on a client account, but also learning copywriting. So maybe it's a new development language. Maybe it's Squarespace, maybe it's WordPress, maybe it's Webflow. Really great time to, to learn a new skill. Um, you can learn that on LinkedIn Learning if you have a premium account, which maybe you don't, that's okay. Lots of free stuff on YouTube that's incredible. Alex does an amazing job with all her videos. Go back and binge through those. Mm -hmm. um, just about anything you'd wanna learn, you can probably find online, uh, cheap or maybe even for free. 
um, with everything going on with COVID-19, I've cut all the prices on my freelancing school courses in half because I just want to help as many people as I can. So if you're looking to dive deeper into how to market yourself, how to build this budget, if you want that budget tool, if you need help with proposals and contracts, I'd love for you to check it out. And again, we'll share that after all of this. Yeah, we'll paste the link in the chat, guys. And um, just just to make it clear, like Jay's doing a huge, I mean, to cut his the cost of his products in half is freaking massive. Um, and that link is not an affiliate link or anything. It's just truly like want his knowledge to be helpful to you guys. So we'll share that link if, um, if any of you are interested in getting that. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing that, Jay. That's awesome. For sure. For sure. I think it's, I think it's important right now. Um, idea number seven, start that side project. Speaking of not having enough time or thinking that you haven't had time to do something, <laughs> this is an amazing time to get started on a creative or side project that you've been putting off for a while. So if you've been wanting to start a blog or an email list or a podcast or a book or even drop a rap album, mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a really great time to get that done. And that may just sound like a fun way to spend your time and to burn time. But this also helps you build your portfolio if you think about it that way. You can build a new portfolio of your own work, of your own projects that you've yeah. built for yourself. And that's really powerful because you'd be surprised how often you get hired because of the passion projects that you do and not because of the client work in your, pro in your uh, portfolio. Clients will often take things safe and may not even let you do all the things that you wanna do on a project. When it's your own work, you can do whatever you want. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's, it's that uh, creativity and ingenuity that clients see and say, I want you to do this type of thing for my company. Mm -hmm. And I mean, going back to the social media manager that I was just telling you about who I hired, I actually hired her not because she had actually any experience, but she had a personal blog. And I was like, wow, she's a really fun writer. She, se she seems to get this whole kind of thing. Um, and it was purely her personal blog that I was really impressed by even though she's never been hired as a copywriter or a social media manager. And I think that, you know, I, I talk, I have a video, um, you guys, if you haven't seen it, the ways to start copywriting, if, even if you have zero um, experience, this is the time to really start doing some creative writing, start a blog, um, you know, write hypothetical copy, you know, people who are hiring copywriters. Yes. If you have experience and can showcase results, that's great. But if you can't, I can still see that you're a great writer. If you, write personally for, for topics that you're interested in. And so this is the time that you can start building your portfolio in order to attract clients. 100%. The next idea is to do your part, basically. Be the client that you want to see in the world. Um, we're all hoping that our clients and potential clients keep us in mind and treat us well during this difficult time. But don't forget that you may also be someone's client. You know, for the podcast Alex talked about earlier, I have a lot of freelancers that work with me to get that show produced. And I know that I have a responsibility and I want to be an ideal client for them and really help them out and do what I can here. Um, if other people are depending on you, be the client that you aspire to work with because we all need to do our part. And if you've been considering investing and in supporting a creator that you appreciate their work, this is a great time to do so if you can. You know, even a simple act of support goes a long way. Just, uh, you know, I see it a lot on Twitter right now. This is Matt Ragland who works at Podia. He put out a call and said, hey, if you're on Podia or if you're a creator and you make the majority of your income from your products, uh, let me know and I'll be happy to share with my audience. And he just went ahead and retweeted a bunch of creators like me, awesome. which was very kind of him. Um, and shortly thereafter, another story, I got referred last week, um, a client from someone that I'd never met before. She just tweeted, hey, who can help me with uh, helping someone design a curriculum uh, online? And someone tagged me in that tweet. We talked. Um, I ended up signing a project with that client and I reached back out to her and I said, hey, do you have a PayPal? Like, let me, let me send you a little bit of a referral fee for this because it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that person. Yeah. That never happens to me. <laughs> and I always wish that it would. And so I just thought like, I'm going to put this out in the universe. I'm going to be the person yeah. that goes first and, and uh, pays it forward for this type of thing. Love that. And our last uh, tip here is to keep an eye open for assistance. Look for the helpers, as Mr. Rogers would say. Uh, we, <laughs> we don't know how long this crisis will last. There are a lot of moving parts and new opportunities are popping up constantly. Some of them are government uh, sponsored opportunities like changes to unemployment. 
Some of them are community and volunteer driven. Some of them are private companies. A really great example of that is ConvertKit uh, last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago at this point, announced a creator fund, which has reached over $150,000 at this point. They're basically trying to support as many creators as they can at this time if they have trouble paying for some of their basic needs or paying their bills. Uh, they're offering up to $500 for as many people as they can. It's a really simple form to fill out. Uh, nice. I have a link to this as well. But uh, there are opportunities like this that are starting to pop up because there are people who are doing well and there are people who want to support the creative community. Um, and, you know, it, it takes a little bit of humility to do something like this, but that's okay. Like people know that it's a hard time. Remember, you're not alone. And it's, it's good to be uh, open to opportunities like this. You need to keep your eyes open for them. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there's something very similar called the Freelance Co-op Emergency Fund. Um, you can check that out. And I want to help all of you if I can. I have this very short survey where I'm basically matching skills to people who are coming to me asking for referrals. Because I run this freelancing school, a lot of people come to me and say, Jay, do you know anyone who can help me with this? And so I've created a very simple Airtable that I'll have a link to that you fill that out. You let me know what type of work you can do for people. You show us where your portfolio is. Uh, I'm going to try to refer you to anyone who's looking for help that you can provide. That's there's amazing. Be, there's a public ver. Thank you. There's a public version of this. That's just a directory. Um, when you fill out this form, there's a checkbox that says, do you want to be in the public directory? If you don't want it public, then just don't check it. But I'm trying to make this available to anyone that could use help. They can filter by skills. They can look at your portfolio and they can reach out directly. That's so cool. And yeah, I mean, first of all, that's, that's so awesome. And it's, it's something that I've been thinking so much about because, you know, there, like there is this need in the marketplace for matching, you know, creatives with business owners. And, you know, my focus is always just, and really my passion is teaching copywriting. And I love being able to, to kind of stay in my lane and be able to do that, but to have a resource like this that I can refer to my copywriting students. And, and it's just amazing. Um, and that's just it, guys. I mean, think of if you spent the next week building your portfolio. I know someone asked, I don't know their name, but if they're on the Galaxy S8, they asked, uh, excuse my ignorance, can I use a blog as a portfolio? Sure, if that's what you have, you know, showcase content writing. Obviously, content writing and copywriting is slightly different. I have a video on it if you want to see it. Um, but that's a good place to start, you know, until you can build up more specific copywriting experience, you can be listed on this directory as a content writer and you can set up a blog in literally a day um, and put, write a couple articles and you have a link to a, a working portfolio that you can grow. <clears throat> Excuse me. So yeah, amazing. So we've reached the end of those nine tips. Um, we didn't ask for these lemons that the world has handed us all collectively, but we have the choice. We can sit here and complain about our lemons and do nothing or we can make lemonade and you know it's not going to be easy i don't expect you to be happy or thrilled about this reality but the only way forward is or the only way through is forward so keep going um and i wanted to end this with a little bit of a recap of some very tactical actionable, actionable steps you can take right after this call um, the first one being go back to the eyes and ears dial in your elevator speech dial that in make it simple then reach out to 10 of your advocates to schedule time to talk, talk with them. They'll eventually ask, how are you doing? Uh, and that's a good time for you to start using that elevator speech to describe what you're doing, who you're helping, how you're helping them. Reach out to 10 of those people, schedule time to talk. You don't have to hard pitch or hard sell anybody. Just let them know mm -hmm. that this is what you're doing. And you could use a little help finding people if they know of anyone. Make sure your own social media and your website messaging is aligned to that elevator speech. If you're going to create this toolkit, this box to hand off to other people, they're going to find you online. They're going to find you digitally. Make it streamlined. Make it cohesive. Make it clear. It makes you look really professional. And it really starts to uh, shorten the amount of time it takes for people to realize exactly what you do. Um, then send five outreach emails to potential clients. Send them, send that email template that we had earlier in the slide deck, whether they are uh, already clients you've worked with in the past, people that are warm leads, reach out to them, make specific offers to them, you know, try to get them on the phone first. If you can schedule a conversation and ask them questions about their needs, do that. 
And finally, start beefing up your own portfolio with some of uh, these side projects or some of the things that you yeah. know you need to do for yourself. You can do that for yourself. Absolutely. A couple of resources that we'll share in the slide deck, uh, growth tools, which I shared with you as some of those action guides. Alex has made the recordings for her Copy Posse Launchpad coaching program available at a discount, which is awesome. Um, that's a super premium program that she's offering and to make some of those recordings available is just fantastic. Um, I have a free five day sales course that you can enroll in at freelancing school. But like I said, I also cut these uh, prices for my programs in half. This deck was essentially three or four lessons out of a total of about 58 available in freelancing school. So if you like this and you want to go a lot deeper and you want some specific templates and um, uh, email templates and resources, that's how you can do that. Amazing. Um, so we have a couple questions that I really want to get to. And then of course, if anyone has any questions they want to ask live, just raise your hand. There'll be a little hand raise button um, that you can uh, raise your hand and then we'll unmute you. But just to start, um, Mary's asking, so how do we sign up for the directory? Um, do you want, I mean, I'll definitely send out, guys, I'll send out this slide deck with, um, uh, with all the links we talked about. Um, and then, Jay, do you want, maybe want to share the link to your freelancing school at a discount in the chat? Yeah. I'm wondering if there's like an easier way to do it, but I think the chat is, um, is where it's Here's, at. There's the directory. Amazing. Okay, cool. So the link to the directory, guys. Oh, I think you sent it just to panelists. I, you'll have to change it to all Oops. attendees so everybody can see it. Um, Amy asks, while you're doing that, Amy asks, tip for picking a niche. So um, a few people asked about that, about picking a niche. And honestly, guys, I always like to say, um, you know, do a skills and experience inventory. Like really think about the niches that you would enjoy writing in. Um, that I have my copy posse launchpad students actually go through this exercise in module one of the program where it really helps them look at their past experience and ways that they can use that and leverage that to really get into a niche. But obviously personal passion is really a big part of it. And remember, you can start somewhere and go down that path and you can always change if you find that it doesn't work. Um, but it's really a personal thing. You know, I write in personal development because that's how I got my start and that's how I feel, you know, I love the topic and I also feel the most comfortable doing that. Um, but you might pick parenting or real estate or tech or e-commerce and there's so many different niches out there. So I'm definitely going to do a video on that topic though, too, because enough people have asked that, um, that'll, that'll come in the next few weeks. So hopefully that helps. Um, Jay, you shared your links. Amazing. Okay, great. And actually I'll share the link to in the chat to the launch files recording. So now you guys have all the li main links for the products we talked about. And then of course, everything else, all the additional free resources that Jay is giving. Um, I'm going to email out the slide deck so that you can, um, so that you can make sure to get all of that. Um, I just want to go through a couple more. Everyone says, thank you. That was super helpful. Thank you guys. Ken says, thank you guys for taking the time to educate us. What an awesome webinar. Um, Kim says, you, Jay, you are so awesome. I am so thankful to be connected to such amazing human Thanks, beings Kim. and you and Alex. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a total newbie in learning how to pitch for jobs. I'm feeling a bit dejected about beginning a business right now. I'm feeling a bit better after listening tonight. I suppose the best thing to do is stay the course and get some writing out there to potential client. Um, can, yes. can I add something to that? Yeah. Because I think a lot of people are in that position. Um, there's this there's this old adage um, that's in the startup space that I think actually applies really well here if you adapt it a little bit. And that was basically, it's, it's for people who are fundraising. They would say, if you want money, ask for advice. If you want advice, ask for money. So if you think about your situation, you want clients right now, you want them to pay you, they, you want them to hire you. Start by just asking them for some insight. You know, if you're saying, you know what, I've, I've narrowed my niche down to three different industries, three different types of customers, reach out to people who fit that niche mm -hmm. and say, hey, uh, I think I'm going to start working with uh, physical therapists. I would love to just get your perspective as a physical therapist to, to make sure I'm on the right track. Mm, if you just right. ask them to have a conversation to learn a little bit more about what their day to day is like, you know, you're not trying to pitch them. By the end of that conversation, you'll probably have an advocate. And remember, you have advocates before clients. So if you reach out and you say, give me your perspective as someone who does this every day, 
you can show your personality, you can get them to like you, you can get them to trust you. They might refer that. other people to you who are around them. Um, just start by asking them, you know, some insight with their experience. People love talking about themselves. They love t- sharing what they know. I, that's so true. Exactly. And that's going to give you really good insight. Like you might have a physical therapist that's like, oh my God, that's such a need in this industry. Here's why. And then all of a sudden your sales pitch writes itself, right? That's the like, totally. biggest lesson in copywriting too, is when you ask your, your prospects and your customers for what they need, then just then just use that, use their language to give them what they need. Like when I want to launch the copy policy launch files, I, many of you may, may have filled it out. I did a survey where I said, what's your biggest challenge right now? And surprisingly, I, you know, I wasn't expecting this. Everyone said, because I, I, I don't have a portfolio. And I was like, oh, well, I can help people build a portfolio. And I just use that same language in my, in my messaging. And the same goes for when you're reaching out to clients. Um, so Fabio, uh, Fabio, sorry, asks, uh, how to pro- how do I properly qualify leads to optimize my time in theirs? They get interested in my copywriting services, but then in the middle of the research process, they begin to be defensive and some of them give up. That's a really good um, question, Fabio. I, honestly, I think, I think it's, it's really confronting sometimes because as a copywriter, you go in and you need certain information. I would say just, you know, do as much as you can to ease the process for them. Like go in asking questions and then tell them what you hear and what you think would be a good direction because a lot of people get really um they they don't know the answer and so they get defensive because they feel like oh my god this person doesn't think i know what i'm doing and oftentimes they just don't know how to you know communicate it in an effective way which is your job so i would say ask the right questions and and really encourage them and then be sure to tell them what you think the best plan of action is can i add on to that yes please do um I totally agree with, especially the last part you just said about telling them, like people want to be led. They're hiring you because they want you to know what you're doing and for you to be the expert. So upfront, if you can set the expectation to say, this is my process, by the way, when we get into the research portion of this, you're going to reject it a little bit. You're going to be afraid of it. It's going to be hard and we're going to have to really dig in then. Then when that actually happens in the process, you can say, remember, I told you this would happen. Remember that this is going to be hard. But, um, you know, when you set expectations up front, you mm-hmm. don't have conflicts of them telling themselves, well, this isn't what I expected mm-hmm. because you've helped them create the correct expectation. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can work through some of the challenging times. If you tell them ahead of time, this part's going to be challenging. Mm-hmm. I love that. That's such good advice. Yeah. <laughs> For, you know, yeah. Start with that. Right. Um, we're going to go through a couple more questions in the chat. And then if anyone wants to ask their questions live, please raise your hand. I know a couple of you, I think put your hand down because we probably answered your question, but if anyone else wants to get on live, um, please, please do raise your hand. Um, Yusuf says, Alex, how do you know what part of copy you want to specialize in if you're just starting out? Um, that's a really good question. Honestly, I think pick the one that you feel, um, the most interested in in learning about, for example, if you want to write emails uh, or social media captions, I think that's a better place to start than sales letters, because obviously if you have no experience, you're not going to reach out to people and say, I can write you a sales letter. Um, but you can start with social media captions, maybe content writing. Think of the stuff that they might not think about YouTube video descriptions. I mean, there is a really clear kind of you know, easy formula for that. That's such a pain in my ass writing YouTube descriptions every week. Um, or what about, uh, thank you pages or customer follow-up emails or card abandonment sequences. Think of the less obvious assets that every business might not even be thinking about, but they would need. And if you come in and say, look, I'll write this content for you. And a couple people have asked, you know, whether I should write content or copy content is a really good place to start because it's, more general um and it's it's easier to be honest but then you can use that to get your foot in the door um okay i have a couple questions people who want to join live so miguel i'm going to unmute you and then mac you're coming in next so uh hey miguel are you there uh let me unmute you hello hi miguel hi can you hear me yes sure can okay cool yeah um yeah first of all i wanted to say i really really love the this uh this this workshop and i really like your youtube videos as well i think one of the reasons why i started uh, going knee deep in this whole copywriting thing (laughs) awesome thank you (laughs) you're welcome that makes me so happy to hear yeah i think i typed the question there saying that uh i mean just i just got started and i just Put my website up there already for my portfolio but i think i'm getting some confusion in terms of uh 
putting my works up there because I'm hearing some people say that I should just stick with uh, well formatted Google Docs and some people say that I have to work with a graphic designer to design right as for spec as so as someone who's just starting out though should I do both or should I start with one or the other or, or so yeah that's a really good question and my honestly my answer is start with what's easiest not building a website you know seems like a big daunting task to a lot of people so I always say to people, you don't need a website to get started. Put it in a well-organized Google Doc. That is totally fine. However, if you are able to use a uh, website to showcase your work in a really beautiful and easy to consume and navigate way, then go for that. But don't, don't wait to have a website to get started. Okay, because I already have one up and I think I should be okay. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, if you have that skill and you already have a website, then I would say go with that. Awesome. Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Thanks, Miguel. Okay. Um, oh, Mac put his hand back down. Does that mean he doesn't have a question anymore? Or maybe it's a girl. I don't know. It's hard to tell sometimes with your names, guys. Okay, Adrian, I am going to uh, unmute you now. What, what's okay. up, Adrian? Oh, sorry, I muted you again. Wait one second. <laughs> I meant to mute. I went, I meant to mute Miguel and then I unmuted Adrian. Okay. Hi, Adrian. You're live now. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Uh, I have, uh, so I'm really <laughs> thankful for finding your videos and learning about all the cooperating stuff. And I've set myself to learn this and master this uh, cooperating skill. Mm -hmm. And um, right now I've been focusing on learning about the email part of cooperating. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to work with a couple of companies I've written down and the thing that appealed to me most is to take something they already have and build on that. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's still a good uh, starting point uh, regarding the situation we're in with the whole pandemic and so on? Yeah, absolutely. I think I always love this. I mean, one of my top copywriters actually, um, before she worked with me, she got her last job and got into copywriting because she did exactly that. She found a company she wanted to work for. She found an offer that they had and she rewrote the sales page. And so for you, you could either rewrite emails for an offer that they already have. Um, maybe it's, it's a way for them to make some extra sales during this time, you know, as long as you're using empathy and compassion and not fear mongering and trying to create more panic, you could say, Hey, here's an email sequence that you can use to, to con connect with your community and offer value. Um, you can also look again to the non-conventional places like um, customer follow-up sequences, upsell sequence, email sequences, card abandonment sequences, um, and reach out to them and say, hey, you know, I know revenue has gone down right now is, you know, here are the, a few email sequences that I can write to help you boost your revenue. And, and if it's not something they're already doing, it's going to be a no-brainer to them. Yeah, that's, um, that's exactly the thing I was going for because the companies I'm looking to work with don't really have the email cooperating uh, section put down mm. so like they have the new the newsletters so we can sign up for them but they don't really actually have content oh my they're gosh. not sending Huge out emails yeah yeah and uh, the thing that i'm trying to do is taking everything that they're putting out on like facebook or instagram or linkedin and uh, turning them or using that as uh, foundation because I'm Amazing. doing the research. Right, and getting to so know their brand voice. And convert it, yeah, uh, convert it to a uh, email marketing strategy. I think that's brilliant. I think you could be teaching that right now. <laughs> it's something I want to add on <laughs> to that. I think, that's, I think that's a great strategy, Adrian. Um, the, the line you'll have to toe is remember that anytime you reach out to somebody, um, someone's on the other end of the email that exists right now. If it's a, it's a badly, poorly written blog post or email and you know you could do better, the, the starting point is not, hey, this sucks. The starting point is, hey, I enjoy the, the work your company does. I enjoy your product. I got this email. I have some ideas for you for how I think this can convert at a higher rate. Uh, can I talk to you about them? Start there. You don't put them on the defensive. You're giving them an invitation. 
is a pretty small ask. And again, the biggest win a lot of times to starting a, a client conversation is having a personal conversation up front. Um, so don't just say like, hey, you should rewrite this this way. Um, that comes off a little aggressive and they might get defensive because somebody wrote that work, even if it's not great, even if they didn't try that hard. Right. That's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, hopefully that helped uh, answer your question, Adrian. Yeah. Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Yes, you're welcome. Okay, Renata, I am going to unmute you. Uh, takes a second. Maybe not. Renata, can you unmute yourself and then you'll be live? Do, 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 do. For some reason, it's like not letting me unmute you. No, there you go. Renata. I think, hi guys, how hi. are you? Good, welcome. Um, thank you so much. Thank you for doing this, guys. This is like so helpful in a time like this. Um, You're welcome. And Alex, I've been watching your videos for like three months now and I've like literally just taking your advice and I got a job. I emailed you about it and everything. Oh, that's right. Yay. So exciting. I know I got a job. I have like a few gigs going. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Your, your, um, your work and your videos are amazing. And, um, this is my first time actually getting to hear about Jay, but you've already just given me such a golden tip with that, um, saving $1,200. Oh, yeah, um totally. is like gaining a twelve hundred dollar client i'm like oh my gosh that's like perspective switch amazing <laughs> um anyways my question is i don't even know if, if you're going to be able to give me like a straight answer for this but my challenge right now that i'm finding is pricing and i've watched your video on how to or just basically like steps and strategies on how to price out um because i'm new it's uh, this is just my biggest challenge and i was just wondering like is there is there like how can i i don't even know how to ask this properly but like how do you know is, if you're pricing right yeah like if it's too high because i'm getting that a lot where it's like this is a lot what you're asking is a lot and it's like oh but this is you know based on my time and the effort that i'm gonna have to put in like this is what makes the most sense for me mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of right now where I'm having the most challenge with finding yeah. clients is not sounding crazy. Cause I've had some people say like, you know, like they recognize that I'm new and they're like, what you're asking for is a bit of a stretch. I can get like a, a really experienced copywriter to do it for less than what you're asking me. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's just kind of finding that. Yeah. I don't know. If an answer, I think, but you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that, I mean, honestly, it's about finding balance. And I mean, that's, I think, the hardest thing, even when people ask me what to charge. I, when I'm working with new clients, I still go through that battle in my head, right? And the questions I ask myself are really like, how bad do I want this? And if it's a brand or a client that I'm like, damn, I really want to add that to my portfolio, then I would be more willing to go lower on prices. But I never usually start with going low. I'll start with a price if they say it's too high then you can come back and never just go, okay, I'm chopping my prices. You never want to just make it sound like, okay, uh, I'll go lower. But what you can do is say, okay, what's your budget? Okay, here's what I can do for that amount and work kind of within their budget. And then hopefully they love working with you so much that your prices then later don't actually seem like a stretch. And so I think it's, it's kind of that, that dance between um, find, like honoring your prices and never undervaluing them. You never want to offer a discount without a reason why, right? So if all of a sudden they get back to you and say, that's a stretch, then you say, okay, you know, I understand it's a stretch. That, those are my prices, but here's what I can do. I can offer this part of the project scope for this much. And then you're taking stuff off the plate, but you're still asking for what you would feel comfortable with um, doing that for. And then of course, you know, starting with a smaller project is always a great way just to suss out whether you like working with them anyway, mm -hmm. and then go from there. Um, I know AWAI has a pricing, copywriting pricing list that a lot of people reference. To be honest, I think you can look at it. It's an, it's an okay starting point. The problem is, you know, some of the copy I think is way underpriced and then some of it is way overpriced, at least in my world. And so um, I think you have to stick to your guns and, and really, you know, you know, when you're like dreading a client to say yes, I don't know if you guys have ever had that, but you, that's when you know you've underpriced. If you're like, yeah, actually, totally. I really hope they don't accept this because yeah, that's yeah. a lot of work. And so you got to stick to your guns. You're always going to have people push back. Um, 
you know, and I think if you realize that that's happening nine times out of 10, then you might want to reconsider and you'll find that sweet spot for sure. Would you, and would you do something for free to kind of get in with a company that you're really excited about working with? Or is that just setting no, a bad tone, I, would you say? I personally, I, I w wouldn't take that off the table. Absolutely not. I know a lot of people are out there like never do work for free, but like I started in this whole world getting $800 a month at an internship at a tiny little company called Mind Valley, And now it's a multi-million, hundred million dollar company. And so, you know, I think wow. sometimes you got to, you know, if you really feel aligned with it, go for it. You know, you got to trust your gut with that one for sure. But don't do free work as like the default. Okay. Don't never price yourself so low that you're not excited to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, there are a ton of clients out there. So if you know that's what you're worth and that's what's going to make you happy and comfortable, go find some more of them. Also be aware of your, your budget and your cash flow. If you're in a tough spot and you need that client and they're offering you less than you want, sometimes you can make some trade-offs, but yeah. money is a story. People, people never have trouble finding money for the thing they really, really want. So yeah. if they really, True. really want you, they're going to pay you. Yeah. True. Thank you guys so yeah. much. I really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Hope that helped Renata. Thanks. Um, okay. We have a couple more live questions and I'll go to a couple more in the chat. Um, Donna, I am going to unmute you. Uh, it says unmute, but I don't know. Donna, you might have to unmute yourself. Um, there we go. It says you're unmuted. Hi, Donna. Oh, no, I can't hear you. Donna, Donna, Donna. Zoom's having a, a moment. You know what, Donna? We can't hear you. And ask your question in the Q&A box, not the chat, but in the Q&A box. Um, and we'll make sure to answer. Um, oh, maybe you did. <laughs> it's like you read my mind. I see your question there already. So Donna, I can't hear you, but I see your question. So I'm going to answer it right now. Okay. Um, so Donna says, I have a niche I'm passionate about, but how can I determine if it's profitable? Um, you know, that's a good question, but honestly, any business who's in business is going to need copy. So I would think less about what you can like whether or not that niche is profitable, because that's not your job necessarily to make sure the business is profitable at every niche, every there's businesses in every niche that are profitable and they're going to need copywriters. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know, Jay, if you have anything to add to that. I think she's asking, is it make sense for me as a copywriter to be able to make money working for this niche of customer? And if that is what you're asking, Donna, um, the answer is it's really cheap and really quick to find the answer to that question. And it's by finding people who are that niche and trying to get them to hire you. And if you can't get them to hire you or if they do hire you, but they all tell you that their budget is smaller than you want it to be, mm -hmm. you found your answer pretty quick. Yeah, that's actually a really good, really good thing. Um, and I mean, I, one might say personal development isn't a profitable niche, but you know, it is for me. And so I think it's, it's easy to make assumptions and you don't know until you basically get proof. So if it's something you're really passionate about, go for it, find companies in that niche and, um, and go with it. So, um, on a follow up to that, Amy says, so if your niche is health and wellness for women over 40, how do you find those businesses? I mean, honestly, I, I think the easiest way is to start Googling like how online health programs, online, um, wellness communities, women's health. I mean, just start doing research and you'll start seeing who's advertising on Google AdWords. You'll see the ads pop up. Um, you'll start being retargeted on Facebook. Trust me, it does not take long. You guys will all probably retar be retargeted after this with some, some sort of business or ad that we've mentioned on this call. Um, you just have to kind of go, go gorilla, go old school and, and just everywhere you can go to YouTube, type in health for women over 40, just see what, what comes up. I mean, that's, that's, I think, the best way, unless, Jay, you have any other tips to add to that? Go to the people who are already at the center of the action. So don't go to a, don't go to a community and a forum and just say, hey, this is me and this is what I'm selling. Right. It's a bad time. But go to a community and a forum and see who's already plugged in and be an upstanding member of that community, contribute, mm -hmm. listen, help people, and then build one-to-one one -one relationships with those people who are already in the center of the action, and then you can start to talk to them. That's a really, yeah, that's a really, really great tip. Um, Donna, I hope, hopefully you found that helpful. Uh, and same with you, Amy. I think, I think it really comes down to leading with value first. I talk about this a lot is, yeah, if you can find uh, online Facebook groups, for example, where 
you know, you're not going in there to start pitching people on your, on your, on your services. You're going in there to genuinely interact with people and add value. Um, that's going to be a really powerful way to get started. Okay. Someone with the name user, I'm sorry that that doesn't narrow it down, but user, uh, <laughs> I'm on, I gave you the ability to unmute yourself. If you can unmute yourself. You're unmuted. I can see. Can you say something? Is it us? What's going on? I don't think it's us. Okay. Everyone else can hear us, right? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, user. I wish I knew your name. We can't hear you either. So please um, leave your, your question in the chat and we will um, get back to you on that. I think I, think I see their Q&A is how can I start, start copywriting career as a newbie? I think Alex has a ton of videos on YouTube on that question specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Honestly, guys, I would say definitely check out my YouTube channel. I give a lot of tips on, I mean, you heard it from Renata, right? She got a client just from re watching my videos. So, you know, watch my videos, specifically the one on how to become a copywriter and also how to start copywriting with zero experience, start building your portfolio and then follow the tips that we laid out in this training. Um, okay, guys, I will answer, let's say two more questions. I know that there's like, there's so much going on. Um, Greg put up his hand. So Greg, I'm going to unmute you. Um, or you might have to unmute yourself, Greg. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Can you hey, hear? Greg, what's up? Copy Posse Launchpad in the house. What's up? <laughs> hey, I just wanted to ask, and I've actually been meaning to ask you this for a while now, actually ever since Sam scored his first client, which awesome for him. Um, one thing I thought about doing was looking into like doing proofreading and editing of like any kind of writing, whether that's emails or whatever have you, it's like what, what kind of market would, uh, would there be for something like that? Um, for proofreading? Yes. Yeah, honestly, that's a really necessary skill set, proofreading or copy editing. So the difference between copy or proofreading, copy editing, and copywriting is Copywriters are sort of the more creatives, right? They're the ones that are kind of mapping out the psychology and weaving the offers and all that. Copywriters are horrible spellers, not because we don't know how to spell, but often because our brains work way too fast to do any sort of that, any sort of that I kind of stuff. Uh, you probably see my copyright, my, my uh, typos in my emails. Copy editors are really good at looking at like an overall piece and going, hmm, I feel like this would actually be better down here and this chunk should be better up here. So they're strategic, but they're not necessarily the great, greatest writers, but they're really linear thinkers that can see a user journey and know where it starts and how the arc is supposed to go for that experience. Proofreaders are like the super, you know, the grammar um, Nazis and the people who are super all about spelling and all of those are absolutely necessary. And so that, if you're not yet a copywriter, to be able to reach out to people and say, hey, I have a proofreading, um, service, you know, 24 hour turnaround time. I can tell you that's like super needed skill set. You know, I don't have a proofreader on my team, but I get my team to proofread and they're often not as detail oriented as, as what a proofreader should be. So I think that's a really, really good question and an awesome skill set that you can present as a way to lead into a potential sale. Hmm. That's interesting. Th yeah. uh, uh, thanks for the insight on that. Yeah, you're welcome, Greg. And thank you for everything you're doing right now. Greg's a healthcare worker, guys, and he is taking the time to be on wow. this call, which is amazing. Thank you, Greg. Say, so, please, uh, please don't, uh, just don't delouse me in the street if you see me out and about, please. <laughs> He's going to work doing blood tests and stuff. Um, you're amazing. Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, okay, so the user has his hand up again. So let's see if we can... Uh, if I, the user, it seems so weird to say, are you there? No. User, are you with us? <laughs> Sorry, we still can't hear you. Um, quick question. I think you might be able to answer Jay. Ashley says tips on finding freelance work via LinkedIn. I've heard a lot of people having success, but when I search jobs, they're all full-time employment, not contract work. Yeah, I mean, there might be some things there and you could always try your hand at pitching the hiring managers looking for full-time or part-time employees to, to do freelance work for them. But at the end of the day, I don't think the platform or the medium matters that much. The story here is that you need to build relationships with people directly mm -hmm. and um, you know get them to see the value and get them to believe that you can solve the problems they're having. 
So if, even if you see something on LinkedIn, I would try to start a one-on-one -on -one conversation with whoever posted that, um, as opposed to just like pitching yourself and saying, these are my rates, this is what I can do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I think that's important is you have to treat it as just another way to, to reach out to these potential people, but there's still people at the other end of it, right? And that actually goes to a question I get a lot of, of like, I don't have a, a formal writing degree, but a lot of these job postings say I need to have a formal writing degree or a bachelor of, of writing or something like that. And you know, yeah, a lot of, just like any business, they can say what they want as a prerequisite for someone to get the job, um, but it's not absolutely necessary. And I think sometimes even when they say that, you can still reach out with a portfolio and they might see and love your work and you can kind of go for it anyway. Um, but also you can, you can approach some of the smaller businesses and smaller brands like, you know, those of us who are solopreneurs or have small remote teams and, you know, we're not these big offices looking to bring people in and work from, you know, from there. Um, one more question guys from, um, from Gianmarco. He says, I'm a, a mechatronic and I've always helped people in the workshop. I have a passion for self, um, rep, self reps since I was a child. I don't know what that means. I have been studying marketing and sales for a few years and now I work as a marketing course seller with Frank, Frank Miranda, how can I build my portfolio to do co consultancy on the back end? I'm not able to talk with you. Sorry, it's too late here. I don't want to wake everyone up. Um, honestly, similar to the things we've been talking about, right? So, you know, if you want to build um, a portfolio, doing doing marketing, um, start a start a blog. Just write, find brands that you and ideal clients that you'd want to work with critique and rewrite, re rewrite their work, add that to your portfolio. Um, just always be honest about where you're at, you know, and, and if you're, if you're rewriting work for a client that's never paid you say that, say this isn't a paid project, but, um, I think, you know, you guys have to be creative in terms of finding, uh, finding ways to showcase your creativity. And it's not always going to be right up, right up front through a paid copywriting gig. I know that, you know, the way I started was at Mind Valley doing customer service. Uh, and then I kind of went into blogging and then I was doing ad writing for Google pay-per-click advertisements. Um, you know, you end up putting your foot in a lot of different pots and something sticks and then you go, oh, okay, great. That's what I'm going to start writing in my portfolio. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the biggest thing is just to start. And I think it's easy to think ahead and think 10, 10 steps ahead and go, oh my gosh, how is that going to work? But as long as you start, um, you'll, the next step will present itself definitely. Um, but yeah, guys, I think we're going to wrap up. I thank you so much to all of you who, um, who stayed on here till the end. We really appreciate your time. Uh, again, Jay, anything else you want to share last minute? I will be sending out the recording and everyone will have access to the slides and the link. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll send out everything that we've talked about here. Um, while I've got you here, I would love for you to get on my email list. I'll share the replay there as well at jklaus.com. Um, lots of free, free resources there and on freelancing school. So please check it out. I'm, I'm here to support you during this tough time, but you know, just because the world is slow doesn't mean that you have to come to a halt too. get out there That's and right. do your thing. That's right. And yes, I will plug his podcast. Amy reminded me. I will um, follow my Instagram at, at Coffee Posse if you're not already, guys. And I will make sure to give a shout out to Jay. Congratulations on your new podcast, Jay. I can't wait to hear it. And um, to everybody else, thank you so much. And I will see y'all soon. Thanks, Bye. Guys.